Awesome. Hello, and welcome back to the ROI channel, the channel that's obsessed with the art and science of return on investment. And today, I'm going to go through a, a super relaxed um, presentation that I have um, in an undisclosed location, enjoying uh, life at the moment. I'm going to talk about uh, stock analysis, uh, free analysis on YouTube for you guys. It's been a while since I've done them because I've been very, very busy doing a lot of paid content for paid customers. And yeah, we're going to go through, have a look at Selena Hotel and Hostels. Uh, it's a business I know very, very well, uh, having spent about three months uh, overseas. And I think it's very, very interesting that in terms of the business model. The question will always be around the valuation from an investment perspective. So let's take a look. Uh, I'm going to jump right in and it's going to be super relaxed, uh, Martin in hand. Disclaimer, of course, nothing here is financial advice, guys. You know that. This is just my opinion. This is what uh, I think, what I am doing, subject to change. So please do not mistake any of it as advice. You need to do your own due diligence and consult your own qualified professional personal advisor, and that is not me. Okay. So here's a little backstory about Peter Lynch, uh, one of the best investors of all time. Now, what's very uh, unique or what this guy really brought to uh, to fame around the world is his model of selecting ideas for investment uh, came off his own personal use or the use of people close to him. So that, uh, if you read his book, One Up on Wall Street, um, it, it's a great book. He goes through lots of different things and many examples of him coming across a product or service in his own life asking questions about whether that has a, an investable opportunity in public markets, because if he really likes it, uh, the business or the service, chances are others do as well. So there's a little bit about his um, background, phenomenal track record. And he gives many examples of uh, a sandwich shop that he always used. And then when they had an investment opportunity, he looked further into that and invested uh, products that his wife would often use. He would go and discover more about that. Um, basically having a raving consumer base was one of the key indicators that he used to consider whether there was a, a case to investigate further in a particular business opportunity. So having uh, used uh, many of the Salinas facilities and, and stayed in a, um, in their accommodation, uh, I really, really was impressed with the uh, brand that they had. Um, basically, in every country, I've been in the Salina in over five countries. I've been to the original one in, in Panama. Uh, I've been there for just for drinks and entertainment. I've stayed there in different forms of accommodation. So we're going to talk about that. I was super impressed with it. And it made me think, well, they've just had a, a recent IPO, relatively recent. I wonder what the valuation is on this business model. So qualitatively first, I have to say it's very impressive. I was impressed with uh, the concept. They're fairly new to market, only uh, been in public markets for um, a couple of years. However, their concept has taken off. They are a hotel hostel chain that have combined the two models. So you have the ability to go in, let's say as a, a young backpacker, you've got anywhere from uh, four to 12 bed uh, dormitories uh, in most Salinas. Uh, so it's very uh, budget-friendly accommodation. It caters to everything that that particular type of crowd is looking for. So you have common areas, common kitchens. Um, they have a, a very systematized uh, welcome or sales structure. So when you go to check in, um, someone's in charge of showing you around the, the compound, wherever that may be, and what that particular Salina facility has on offer, whether it's gyms, uh, common room, gaming room, and they always have a welcome drink where everyone that is new to that Selena that night uh, comes together, introduce yourselves, uh, opportunity to make friends, which is what a lot of people are looking for uh, whilst traveling. Their particular target market is the, I guess, people like me. So uh, digital um, digital workers or digital business owners um, that have, a, I guess, a an affinity for travel. And so they're combining the two models. They give you a place to stay. They give you obviously free Wi-Fi that is the same code everywhere around um, the world in any given Selena. So my phone and my laptop, anytime I go into a Selena, it automatically connects and I'm good to go. Uh, the super chilled out vibe, you don't need to go into a Selena and have to buy something or be a guest to use the Wi-Fi. It's, um, it's like McDonald's in that sense. And I think they've done very well. That's a huge um, draw card, I suppose, for uh, people overseas. Um, 
you just get to a destination, you don't have a local SIM, you need to use the internet and you find your local Selena and that will help you get set up. So already I have, uh, well, myself have been an example of Selena exhibiting this share of mind in branding. I can't really think of another hotel or hostel uh, that is like that. I don't go into a, a new city and look automatically for a, a Marriott Bonvoy, for instance, of which I happen to be a member just because I've stayed there before, but it's not on my, it's not a share of mind. Okay. Whereas uh, I might look for a McDonald's because I know they'll have uh, say a bathroom, coffee and um, Wi-Fi. I think Selena is uh, already in my mind, at least up there. If I, if I can find a Selena, I know I'll be able to find a friendly group of people, uh, a Wi-Fi and um anywhere from budget accommodation through to some of the places I stayed where they, um, the staff showed great initiative. They gave me free upgrades into like a ski lodge in Bariloche and it was amazing. So I really am impressed from a qualitative perspective as to the business model and they have everything organized. It's not just like any hotel where you, you, you go there, the, the person working behind the desk really doesn't care. They just look up, okay, it's check in, give me your, um, documents. Yep. You're in room number X, Y, Z off you go. Uh, it's very, very different. And I think they've done a great job in doing that. From my perspective, at least their property selection has been absolutely top notch from uh, Casco Viejo in Panama to Playa Venal in Panama. They have um, a wonderful beachfront um, properties. If you're following me on Instagram, I'll put uh, several pictures up about the properties. The ski lodge in Bariloche uh, in Colombia as well. The Medellin property was um was stellar uh, in the best parts of town, um, uh, Playa del Carmen in, in Mexico, same deal. Uh, anywhere I've gone, they, they seem to have done an excellent job in selecting their properties. And uh, I believe that they have done a very good ex expansion program acquiring these properties. And now it's about optimizing them to increase revenue per square meter or revenue per, per bed space. Uh, okay, now why are you going to stay in... Selena versus Airbnb versus uh, hotels. Well, uh, hotels, honestly, they're very hit and miss. Uh, the best experiences I've had by far were in this kind of Selena because you, you can choose your own adventure and to your own budget. So I was able to get um, you know, private beds because that's just where I'm at in my life. I don't want to be in a, a, a 20 or a 12 room dorm. Uh, yet I have access. So I, I get a good sleep. I have the bed that I want, uh, my own bathroom amenities. And yet I can jump down in the common room and talk to people and you know, drink mate or whatever, okay? Whereas with Airbnb, I've just noticed, uh, and I did stay in all three, uh, so hotels, Airbnb, and Selena. Airbnb has gone downhill big time, in my opinion. I don't think they're the best value for money that they they used to be. There were a heap of rules, like if you're in a, a common property, like, oh, you can't be drinking water or eating and the rooftop with a pool. And it's just all this rubbish where you know, someone like me, I just I don't want to deal with that. I go there, have a good time, freedom. Um, and all these extra fees and charges, like uh, in Mexico, Airbnb, um, I guess it was a, a host thing, but they wanted me to pay for extra electricity and um like cleaning of laundry and all this sort of all this sort of rubbish where um you just didn't get that hotels uh very underwhelming i was in a supposedly five star hotel it was maybe four stars at best um amenities like i didn't even have a kettle in my room uh so i wanted to boil some water i had to go downstairs and ask in the restaurant for them to to fill up my thermos so it was very poor uh yeah so uh, i just don't i just don't see it hotel airbnb if you're looking for kind of doing your own cooking and that sort of stuff you used to go for the airbnb but airbnb is not really that good anymore you just the amenities aren't great selena's just got common or private kitchen depending on your on your budget and what you want and uh at very very competitive pricing um so qualitatively i i can see that taking off uh let's take a look at the actual numbers of the company so here's a one pager uh, as of April 2023, their revenue is expected to come in end of 2023 around quarter of a billion. So between 240, 250, we're going to look at that in a moment. They are not profitable. And this is very unusual for me to look at a non-profitable company. We're going to talk about um, why a longer term view that that could be interesting. Their negative EBITDA, negative free cash. Obviously, they don't have any free cash then. Uh, market cap, 156 mil. Um, they've had a massive sell down. And their enterprise value, 913 million. So obviously they're carrying a lot of debt load. 
which makes a lot of sense given their operations. So they're, they're looking to expand physical locations, buying properties. They needed to finance that um, somehow. That will be the, I suppose, the major concern for the company will be servicing in the medium, short to medium term in order to execute their growth plan and generate the free cash in the future. So it's not typically a company that, uh, or a model that I would look at. However, um, I find it very interesting. And I think that there could be a lot of hidden net asset value in the properties in which they own. Okay. And uh, price as it close, uh, $1.50 and 98 million uh, rounded up shares on issue. Book value looks to be negative because of the debt load. Uh, I think there's a lot of hidden value potential in their property. And I just wanted to, again, harp on a point that I've made on the channel many times. The return on equity looks amazing at 45%, but that's because there's very little equity used to, to fund this business. It's mainly debt. So obviously you, you've shrunk the denominator there and it makes it look, I would, I would say, artificially elevated from a return on equity perspective. Okay, so some other notes. This was part of the SPAC bubble, really. Uh, they had a, a public trust. People put in money and then they... They use that money to go out and, and purchase properties. Now, it, it's very difficult for me to verify this. So I'll be waiting for them to file a proper 10K or foreign equivalent. Um, the company apparently had that in the public, uh, all this cash raised in the public trust as part of the SPAC. The interest earned on that apparently was enough to cover their OPEX. Um, the trust was redeemed. And that will partially, I suppose, explain the like 80, 90% drawdown in, in share price, um, but not all of it. And obviously I can't uh, verify it. So it's a big question mark. Hypothetically, if this were the case and their cash were able and their interest were able to cover their OPEX, that would be amazing because they'd have all these properties now that interest would cover their CapEx and would easily get them through to the point where they could hit their growth runway and start to develop free cash from their enterprise rather than their balance sheet. And by that, I mean by their, their actual uh, selling or renting of beds and all the you know, food services and things that they go on from their business operations could generate free cash. Uh, while they still had this cash on the balance sheet, they could use that to pay down debt, fund further expansion, et cetera. So we're still waiting on that. Um, so that's definitely a wait and see. Alrighty, this looks terrible and it is terrible. Um, stock price November was uh, north of $45.00. Uh, and now it's training at a dollar forty, so a massive cliff dive. That's a big part of that uh, is the SPAC bubble, and uh, that redemption so has gone from having a public trust. Uh, a lot of people have liquidated their shares, and um, yeah, that uh, that is a big part as to why it's such a, a steep dive. Uh, this will become important in a moment. So, how are we going to value this business when it's not making any cash? So. We can take into account a longer time frame and do expected cash generations. So I've done that. I'm going to show that in a second. Or we can look at this EBITDA and then apply multiple saying, well, okay, it hasn't generated a lot of, or hasn't generated positive cash yet, but it does have a lot of assets. It's got a very good enterprise. If we applied a multiple to that, what would that look like? And so, okay, we need to find out the EBITDA and then we need to find out a multiple. So which multiple are we going to use? I've taken a, a quick snapshot here from my software that you can see showing its competitors and the multiples that are using, um, that the market is applying to their competitors, okay? So Airbnb, do I think Selena is better than Airbnb? In many ways, at least from the use case, yes. Uh, Selena have their own app. It's not as worldwide uh, with as many options as Airbnb, obviously. Uh, and it doesn't give you the one, you know, they're only gonna show you Selena hostels and hotels. Um, but if you're getting a in essentially a five percent cash yield or EBITDA yield with a twenty multiple on Airbnb, I think that's I think that's crazy. Um, I don't think Airbnb is that good. So maybe we use um, maybe a six to eight. Um, pretending it was back in its private equity days would be extremely conservative. I think probably even a, a ten to twelve EBITDA um, multiple might be applicable. But obviously that's uh, that's up to you. When I go in a moment to extrapolating, uh, building a model and, and and estimating what sort of cash can be generated by the business, we need to have an idea of some margins. Now, this company hasn't got there yet, so we can look at its competitors and say, well, look, if it's in this ballpark range, what would that look like using the rest of the company's numbers and data? So what you're looking at here is the Hilton's uh, margins over 
uh, nearly 20 years. Okay, so they've hovered, uh, COVID hit, and, and they went negative. But every other year, they've been above 15%, and they're expected to actually grow their margins uh, to 20%. Uh, and now this is EBIT, so it's after taking into account depreciation and amortization. Okay, so uh, back of the envelope. We're going to have a look at the investor relation presentation in a minute. Back of the envelope valuation is my favorite. Why? Because it's super simple and we don't get lost in the weeds. So what is the what is the model of this business? How does it make money? It gets properties, it rents out beds and sells additional services like uh, you know, food, drinks, activities, uh, and has local affiliate partners and gets commission off all of that. Fine, great, wonderful. So it's revenue and eventually it's profit. Should it get there? Will be a function of how many beds it has, the dollar value of that um, user per bed over a year, if we're looking at annual revenue. And then if you want to work out profit will be how, um, how efficient it is in managing its expenses. So the company should come in at around 40,000 beds across the world uh, by the end of 2023. And conservatively estimating $7,000 in revenue per bed space globally. So that works out to be roughly $280 million in revenue for this uh, end of 2023. Okay, great. Very simple. It's com competitors, the EBITDA margins are in the 20% range. Okay, the EBIT for uh, Hilton we just saw uh, has been above 15% every year since, uh, except for the COVID fiasco. And they continue to grow those margins. So if could I conservatively take into account the fact that this company has a lot of interest payments uh, and DNA and look at the EBIT and say, well, maybe it's not going to be 20%, but maybe it'll be 10% or even 15%. And I don't think that's particularly unreasonable. And we could we could kind of use that as a as a guideline. So if we get our revenue. We don't know what the margin is going to be, but we can estimate and we can come up with various models um, using that. So what I've done here, I've used a 10% margin. Let's assume they do get to 280 mil this year in sales and they just have a 10% EBIT margin, okay? Divide that by the number of shares outstanding, assuming that they stay constant. And you get on a per share basis, for every dollar you pay, you get 29 cents in EBIT. That is not free cash. Um, but if we were looking at a private business buying it out, you would use a, an acquirer's multiple very similar to this, if not the same. So if we applied an enterprise value to EBIT of eight, okay, so eight times um, 29 cents per share, that would give you a very rough implied price of $2.28. Now, I'm not saying that's going to happen by the end of 2023. Market conditions obviously will change, but it gives us a rough ballpark figure on one estimate of valuation, which would imply a, at least a 50% upside. Okay, now before... Uh, we go on, I'm just going to go through a few things, okay? And from here, we can see this investor presentation. So their growth rate has been phenomenal, albeit from very uh, low base effects because we had COVID and obviously this type of business is not going to be able to function very well in COVID. Um, but if you're looking at this uh, triple digit growth rate, even from 21 to 22, that's very impressive when we still had a lot of restrictions around uh, global travel. I don't, I'm obviously not going to model triple digit uh, growth rates, but uh, double digit growth rates over the next, say, three to five years, I believe is very possible for this type of business uh, using their models. So that is the, the overall revenue growth. Their occupancy rate is growing at double digits, and that's very important, obviously. Uh, I would more or less ignore 2020, 2021 for the, the COVID factor that I mentioned, uh, but you can see here, there's a lot of room for growth. There's still less than 50% uh, occupancy rate. And I think that that will, uh, I think that that will increase a lot uh, in the coming years. If you can get to say 70%, uh, which would be good uh, in this type of industry or 80%, which would be excellent. You can imagine the flow and impact that that will have on sales and, and eventually free cash. Uh, annualized revenue per bed space. So they're, they're optimizing their bed space uh, very, very well uh, year on year. And that is through their different activities and add-on sales that they have. And they've got this all in a very good system. Uh, or a lot of the tours, uh, basically all the tours that I did while I was overseas were um, 
were organized through Selena. They have the person that you know it's going to you know, you know it's going to be verified, so you don't have to worry about buying a ticket off some guy off the street that may be a, a dud ticket. You just in your Selena, you, you're there. They have a, a little sales window, and you just say which one you want. They'll give you advice, and they'll give you the best price that you can get on the on the tours. So those types of things. Um, there's no reason why that can't continue to seriously grow, especially with people like me have great experiences. They pass on uh, that word of mouth referral. Uh, occupancy rate growing quickly. EBIT. Now this is the key. So currently they they are negative, but they are getting very very close to break even, and they do expect to be positive um, from an EBIT and cash generation perspective this year. So remains to be seen. Um, but they're certainly trending in the right direction, as you can see by this reporting. Uh, all this is very good, no problems. Um, missions, pretty standard stuff. Um, reducing corporate overhead. So here are their expansion plans, and that's where I'm getting that sort of 40,000 bed spaces by the end of the year. I think that they they should be able to, to do that. Uh, okay, more growth when it comes to EBITDA. Now, this is a capitalization table. This, um, hmm, I, don't, I don't know, because as you can see in the fine print here, as of June 30, the pro forma for the D SPAC, um, I, I want them to actually file a proper, um, a proper quarterly form uh, with the SEC before I can, can verify this. So this convertible notes, um, and other corporate debt, will that lead to further dilution? That's what we don't want because then that 98 million share count will grow and the company will be less profitable on a per share basis, all else being equal. So do they have a dilution risk? That's, I don't know one way or the other. It's just a, a question mark. So liquidity, being able to fund their operations in the short term until they can grow into the point where they can hit uh, profitability and they can pay down all the outstanding debts and obligations uh, and dish out profits to shareholders from their operations. That's the question. Hard to know until we get that balance sheet from a proper form filed with the SEC, um, which it shouldn't take too long. We'll see. Restructuring of certain liabilities into equity. That's what I'm talking about, dilution. That's what we don't want. Um, so if it came to a point where they had a liquidity crunch, they didn't have cash to service their obligations. They may have to issue shares, uh, which would dilute current shareholders. Modify existing convertible note terms, maybe. Um, not sure how you'd go negotiating that. Um, sure, they'd try. Ability to draw remaining a $50 million loan. Okay, so that might get them through in the in the meantime. That that would be my, my preference. I know it would add more to the debt load, but at least it would keep the share count uh, intact. And if they are able to execute, which it appears that they are, they are doing, and they're not far away from profitability, that would be the way to do it. Uh, using lines of credit to draw capital, same kind of deal, really. And then work with landlords to restructure rent. Yeah, good luck with that. Um, although, I guess if you're a landlord and you have a big corporation, um, if they... You know, if they if they fold, if you if you're too strict with the the rent terms, they decide to fold, then you you you're going to struggle to get your rent back and damages. You can do more you want, but if they file Chapter Eleven, um, yeah, it's not going to happen. So uh, maybe, maybe, and that's all I really wanted to to talk about there. There, the verdict is uh, I'm not invested, but I'm watching curiously. I think it's a very very interesting um, business model. We'll see how we go. Uh, hopefully, you enjoyed that. Any questions, leave them in the comments section. And if you're not a member of the ROI Club, uh, you probably should be. It's uh, a private publication that I do on Substack. It's my entry-level product. Uh, it's $5 a month if you pay annually, and you'll get access to fully in-depth stock valuations um, at least once a month, plus a macro scoreboard and commentary that I, I put on there. You can try it out for free for seven days. So you can go access everything for seven days. And if you don't like it, you just simply um, cancel before you pay. Um, yeah. So I hope that you enjoy that, guys. Any questions, leave them in the comment section. Uh, if you're uh, enjoying the investing style, take a look at the eToro portfolio. You may wish to copy it or simply follow along. And do follow me on Twitter at the ROI channel. Thank you for watching, and I'll be back uh, with another video shortly.